And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us all the way from Absolute Tabletop, creators of the Mecha Hack and its upcoming expansion, the Mission Manual. The one and only Matt Click. How are you doing tonight, man? I am doing great. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank, thank you for com- thank you for coming on. So, it's a bit of a tradition around here to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. With that in mind, um, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and how and what was it that made it stick for you. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, when I was probably about uh, 11 or 12 years old, uh, my dad introduced me to the Star Wars uh, role playing game, the old West End Games D6 system. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that's what I that's what I cut my teeth on mm-hmm. uh, back in the day. Uh, played that for many years and I, I'm still playing it today. <laughs> it's probably my favorite Star Wars system. Um, and, uh, from there, uh, moving on to like Dungeons and Dragons third edition, I played a lot of Savage Worlds and from there, uh, you know, moving into college and stuff, I just branched out and explored a bunch of different systems and games. And, uh, eventually after college, I got started in working in games, uh, as an editor, I worked on a bunch of stuff with fantasy flight games and, uh, eventually, uh, got brought on to edit with Wizards of the Coast, uh, worked on some D&D stuff. I worked with Chaosium, uh, Artelsorian Games, and uh, all kinds of, uh, Green Ronin as well, just all mm-hmm. kinds of companies out there. And uh, that's kind of my job now. So I uh, started at 10 or 11 years old, rolling fistfuls of dice. And now here I am uh, sort of uh, putting food on the table doing it. So yeah. Uh, yeah, that's how I got started. And it definitely, it stuck with me because I it was just this, uh, the collaborative storytelling aspect of it that just really, truly appealed to me. So mm-hmm. now since you mentioned, since you mentioned um, Star Wars D6, as I've, as I've called it to do sh- um, for the sake of my sanity and for the fact that I'm not paid by the syllable, um, are you, since you mentioned that you still do it, are you familiar with the re-up version? Yeah, I, I am quite familiar with re-up, uh, and that's what I, uh, I, I usually run with re-up, but I actually have, I have my own hack, uh, of the D6 system that mm-hmm. is kind of based on re-up, um, but it also pulls in some stuff from, uh, Jez Gordon's D6 rules essentials and further kind of streamlined stuff and, uh, implements things like static defenses and stuff like that mm-hmm. um that is i call it hyperspace d6 and uh that's what i usually run uh these days is is that system just because I, I like it for simplicity's sake yeah i can i can get you um i ended up i will freely admit to that um i ended up finding out about re-up a bit late simply because i found out about it due to some of the fan attempts at making co- at making covers for it which are really really impressive <laughs> Yeah, there's um, some gorgeous covers for reup. Yeah, and if I if I had the if I had the mean if I had the actual printing means to do it, I'd probably use I'd probably use that because I still have my um, physical copy of Revised and Expanded, which up until reup was my definitive version to play. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I've got um I've got a few different editions sitting on my shelf, and I actually do have a copy of reup. Um, with one of those covers, and it is—it's a massive tome. It's—it's it's a huge, one of the biggest books on my shelf, actually. So, um, well, it's, it's at least good to have a to have a giant to have a giant good have a giant good book that you can actually bring to people instead of a to have a giant tome that's for that's large and foreboding. Looking at you, yeah, Hero it's... Games. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. Very true. I got I got no beef with here with hero games. I just like I just like bringing that up whenever somebody complains about RPGs being too complicated. Or like they'll tell they'll tell me that D and D is too complicated, and I'm like, you say that again, and I will throw the sixth edition hero system books at you, <laughs> and I'm going to keep throwing them until you get it right. Right. <laughs> um, or God, or God help you, God help you if you if I feel if I'm feeling really vindictive, I'll throw GURPS fourth edition at them. Yeah, there you go. There's a <laughs> big honk and tome there. Yeah, yeah. But now the mech, now the mecha hack obviously is a mech version, is a uh, mech spin on the black hack. How yeah. did you first come across the black hack? 
Um, I actually, I can't remember when I first stumbled upon the black hack, but I just, <clears throat> I remember um, uh, I was just looking for something that was um, good for new players. Um, Cause I, I, I do a lot of uh, introducing people to RPGs and um, mm -hmm. you know, D and D is it, really anything can be, can be good to bring in a beginner, but I liked the, the true simplicity of the black hack um, and just how, uh, lightweight it felt to run and uh, the simplicity of character creation as well was really nice for new players and um, so I, I, I ran a lot of black hack and got to know the system really well and also checked out some of the other uh, offshoots that are out there like the Cthulhu hack and the space hack and I mean there's there's tons of awesome stuff out there using the system um, and actually uh, connected with David Black uh, the author of the of the game and I kind of got to know him a little bit and um, worked with him a little bit on a couple things. And uh, eventually I uh, just kind of got a wild hair and on a whim asked him, you know, hey, if, has anyone ever done a, a mecha hack, you know, black hack? And he was like, I, I, I don't think so. Not that I know of. And I was like, okay, well, dibs, like I want to do it. Like, I think I could do it. So uh, that's how that kind of came about. Which makes, definitely makes sense. Um, now I've, I've talked with, I've talked with a few other pe a few other people when it comes to the way that mechs can take can take various forms, and the consensus that I've gotten is that there are two there are two major camps that you can put most mech works into: the stompy and the spiky. Um, stompy are are the ones that very much lean towards tank like design. You know your mech, right. your um, battle tech. Um, arguably Starship Troopers, although the mechs were, the mechs were only in the novel and never in, never in the film. Mm -hmm. Um, and the spiky, which is the, which is the more, um, power armory, the, the kind of stuff that you would see go in a guy or Tomino work, work on when he's not murdering right. half the cast that is. Right. <laughs> um, when you were designing the, when you were designing the mecha hack, were you leaning to have a... A bit of both, or was there one particular camp that you were leaning towards? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, for me, I you know I I grew up watching Robotech and uh, uh, Gundam shows, but I also played a, a ton of Mech Warrior um, and really devoured uh, anything BattleTech related. And so for me, I have I have a lot of love for uh, both of those camps, uh, you know, and both kind of like Western and Eastern Mecha sensibilities and tropes and stylings and stuff mm -hmm. and so there's a there's a lot in the mecha hack that pulls from battle tech the stompy robots but there's a, there's a ton that pulls from the more spiky sort of like super robot type stuff so um <clears throat> i've seen uh you know a lot of people run more gritty grounded more like kind of battle tech style games but then there's also people running voltron you know so mm -hmm. i think that it's uh, the system is lightweight enough where you can kind of with very little uh fiddling get it to work uh for either one but i would say for me like at definitely i came at it with like equal portions of love for for both of those styles of of mecca and i i and you already answered one of the questions i was going to ask which was which was um how you got in, how you got into mecca and that uh, i'm pretty sure some some of the purists in the te in the temple would probably would probably want to tan your hide over using the term robotech given how that's kind of a dirty <laughs> word yeah i know i know i should have said robotech b b macross is what i mean to say but and uh beca when i was of, a kid it was robotech man so yeah, yeah we did we didn't know we didn't know any better like exactly i <laughs> I grew up as much of a Power Rangers kid as anybody else, and how was I supposed to know that that was a series that, that had been around since the 70s? Right, exactly, yeah. And, and since, I, since, I've br since I've brought up Robotech, I have to do the obligatory fuck you, Harmony Gold. <laughs> because <laughs> That's a given, yep. That, look, I don't make the rules, I just follow them. <laughs> until I feel like bending them. Um... But given the given the fact that you were that you were trying to make what sounds like a sandbox when it came to when it came to the approach with mech. Now I know this was something that you grew up on, but what would you say is the appeal of mecha? Because when it when people jump in people jump into that sort of thing, there's always something about these giant robots that grabs them. 
Yeah, <clears throat> there really is. And that's that's something that I've I've talked with uh, people who have played the game before um, who aren't necessarily into Mecha or have never really uh, consumed any sort of like Mecha media of any kind is there they find this uh, this enjoyment that they didn't know that they would have for the game and for the genre um, just in experiencing it through the lens of an RPG. And I think that for me, um, the thing that kind of draws me to Mecha is just the the variety of stories that are being told um, like with the added bonus of there being gigantic robots beating the snot out of each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I've always thought that like tanks and stuff are really cool and uh, mecha designs kind of lend themselves to that feel. that's just like invincible, heavy plated armor with the added benefit of this is your mecha. Like you mm -hmm. customize it how you want. You pick the weapons that it wields. Um, it's an extension of you. It's almost like, uh, finding a cool magic weapon in D&D, &D, but to the nth degree, you know, it mm -hmm. just is this all-encompassing sort of uh, thing. And uh, it was, you know, growing up watching shows like Gundam Wing, everyone had their favorite Gundam and for different reasons, you know. And I want to get across that feel in the mecha hack where your mecha is not just a tool that your character is wielding. It is your character. Your character is your mecha and the pilot and the mecha are one and the same. And uh, that I think is why the system has seen a good amount of success mm -hmm. um, in a sea of other mecha RPGs is that it's one of the few that I've seen that, that kind of do away with this idea that the pilot and the mecha are separate entities mm -hmm. and instead rolls them together uh, into a single character. When it came when it came to the idea of a of a single character, the only thing I can think of that really came close is Cthulhu Tech, and yep. Cthulhu Tech had the had the unfortunate problem of being in a little bit um, swingy. Yeah, for sure. Um, you're you're either gonna roll like shit or you're gonna roll really well. There was no in between. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, and for sure. In when I was when I was running Cthulhu Tech, I tried to mitigate that. Effectively by stealing the river mechanic from Weapons of the Gods. Oh, okay. Interesting, yeah. So, have, have it so that dice that you're not using, you can bank and then you and then swap them out with, uh, with other dice later on. It wasn't a perfect fix, and I could never get the balancing right for us in terms of how many, you, how many somebody could do so that they don't just Nova the whole thing. Right, <laughs> right, um, yeah. But it at least was an, it was at least an attempt because I do like the concept of framework. It just ne it just needed some reining in. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the sole reason I ended up taking that approach is since they wanted to make the comparison with um, poker dice, I say, why don't we why don't we steal from video poker in that case? Right. Um, but w it's interesting that you bring up um, Gundam Wing because. If you if you stop and think about it, each of the each of the main each of the main group of um gu of Gundams in that series, excluding excluding stuff like Epion and Tal and Talgies, which are a whole different which are a whole different can of worms. Mm -hmm. Um, each of them was tailor built for a specific type of combat theater. Totally, like Wing is very much meant as a as a um, air and space superiority type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, heavy arms is meant for urban combat. Mm -hmm. You know because because that's going to have lots of choke points so we can just sit his ass down and just keep raining bullets. Yep, yep. Um sand rock obviously for desert combat. Mm -hmm. Um death scythe for night out for night operations and stealth and um Shenlong and later Ultron for um, foliage heavy areas, right? Admittedly, 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 that one's the tricky, the trickiest one of the bunch. But that's I figure that's the best analogy than saying close range because most Gundams are going to have a whole lot of close range advantage. Yeah, absolutely. And would it be fair of me to say that you wanted to have that same level of variety so that somebody so that two people setting up their mechs wouldn't be doing it the same way. 
Yeah, uh, that's yeah, that's absolutely something I wanted to achieve with this system. And, um, you know, in addition to the to the four chassis and the four pilots we have in the core book, mm -hmm. there's a ton of these things called modules, which are the add ons, you know, the things that that really give the the mecha their oomph. And, uh, you know, it's things like uh, a barrage of missiles, but it could also be something that makes your reactor better, uh, something that makes you better at hiding, uh, you know, vehicle mode so you can transform. Um, mm -hmm. And in Mission Manual, we're adding four new chassis, four new pilots, and then a bunch of new modules. And so I really want to push that, the variety that people can achieve uh, by combining those different things. And we see in a lot of the games that I run and a lot of the games that I play that people will, even if they don't realize they're doing it, they will theme their mecha after something. You know, they'll, yeah. they'll see a, a chassis and a pilot combination and then a couple of modules that they really like. And they'll they'll stumble upon some sort of cool theme that they want. Um, you know, I, I had a player who um, uh, they picked a grappler uh, module so they could grab things and pull them close. Uh, and they decided to do like a Kraken themed uh, mecha with like tentacle arms and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really neat. Um, and I think that. Uh, people people will will do that inadvertently just because they see cool stuff and they they wonder you know oh I wonder what how this would work with this uh, and in combining them they find some cool uh, sort of like you're saying like specializing in different theaters of combat um, and that's a fun feeling too because then you get to work together as a team to do different things so if you have a mecha that's particularly speedy that focuses on agility and movement uh, they're able to you know move to uh, an objective or move to a critical enemy a lot faster than the others would be able to. And that is something that just kind of happens naturally with players playing this game. And, uh, you know, without, without any guidance, they will naturally fit into a like kind of fire team sort of, uh, mode where they're all supporting each other and, 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 uh, highlighting each other's strengths. Yeah. Um, now when it comes to the four, before we get into the, um, addition, the additional chassis and the like for, that's going to be added in the mission manual, I, wa I wanted to do a bit of a thought experiment with the four chassis that's in the that's in the um, core book. Mm -hmm. um, now I'm getting um, now when it, now you've of course you've got four chassis in the thing and you've got four pilot types. Given given that, I'd like to go through the four chassis and and um, and t and tell me if there's any examples you can you can think of when it comes of representations of that particular chassis whether it be in different anime whether it be in uh, other me other media um yeah and i'll start i'll start with the big boy of course so i'll start with the brawler so what would what would be some what would be some good representation some good um other media representations of a brawler chassis yeah, so the brawler is like uh, it's not a, a super heavy mech, but it is like a uh, uh, a little bit more heavy than a striker or a scout. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that a, a good example of a brawler would be something like like Sandrock or Shenlong in Gundam Wing, something that is uh, really good at moving into close range and mm -hmm. dishing out melee damage primarily. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of its focus in order to uh, in order to excel. All right. What about the scout? With the scout, <clears throat> um, I actually in designing the look of the scout, we kind of leaned a little bit on uh, Pat Labor, uh, the kind of the, the sort of like a uh, urban uh, almost enforcer sort of mecha style. Um, but with the uh, cloaking field and the ability to scout ahead and stuff, um, I actually was thinking a little bit more of. Um, there is this uh, series from Rooster Teeth called Genlock. Mm -hmm. And one of the mecha in that show is uh, it's basically a giant bunny rabbit that rollerblades around and uh, focuses on speed and agility, but also um, like jamming sensors and scouting and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was thinking a lot about that when I designed uh, the scout for sure. Yeah. Um, next would be the striker. The striker is definitely more of a kind of versatile um, uh, jack of all trades type mecha. So with that, I was honestly thinking of the RX 78 too, the original Mobile Suit Gundam. You know, the ability to excel in all combat, 
uh, whether it be space or on the ground, um, having a lot of tools at the disposal. Um, and there's also a little bit of support ability in there too, where the, the striker is able to boost up people's reactors. And so um, the striker to me is really the, uh, the, the quintessential sort of mecha uh, in the book. And even though it isn't a mech, when I see when I see the shoulder missile pods on the striker art, for whatever reason, I keep thinking of Tekaman Blade. I don't know why. Oh yeah, yep, totally. Oh so oh so I'm not the only one think, thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> at the very at the very least at the very least I can em at the very least I can emulate that character without breaking my microphone twice. Yeah, there there you go. Because I'm pretty sure you're familiar with that story. Yeah yeah yeah. If I ever meet him, I want I want to ask, how the hell do you do that? <laughs> right. <laughs> how do you manage that? Yeah. yeah. Um, and last but not least, the Titan. Uh, the Titan is definitely heavy arms. <laughs> it has to be. You know, that's the it's the 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 art. <clears throat> depicts this big chunky mech mm -hmm. uh with a huge chain gun and so that was definitely the uh the inspiration there but also you know stuff like the the atlas from BattleTech, just the big big stompy robot that can uh sustain a lot of damage can tank a lot of damage in addition to brandishing heavy weapons and he heavy armor and things like that oh you mean how steiner scout unit yeah <laughs> yes yeah that one you um I'm, of of course I had to of course I had to make that joke because well because well I um I like Black Pants Legions' take on Steiner on Steiner's Scout Squad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um but hey, if no, if there's no witnesses, it's technically a successful stealth mission. That is true. That is true. Um and wh now when it comes to the when it comes to the um, the mission manual, you mentioned that you're ex you're expanding the chassis, and when I look on the Kickstarter page, I see two two the hybrid and the Vanguard. What can yeah. you tell me about what those two bring to the table? Yeah, so uh, the hybrid is uh, a really interesting uh, design. The hybrid is definitely uh, inspired by things like Evangelion, where mm -hmm. you kind of have these like biomechanical mecha. Um, mm -hmm. So the hybrid in in the it, within the flavor of the setting itself is a combination of a mecha and a kaiju, uh, because we have kaiju in the book as well as mm -hmm. enemies. Um, and the big thing with the hybrid is uh, it can dish out some serious damage um it has a d10 damage die but it also has this uh maw beam that it can use that deals d12 damage um but the thing with the hybrid is uh if its reactor uh overheats which you know uh the reactor die is a fairly central mechanic within the game and every other mecha if it uh if it diminishes down to a d4 and then uh and then rolls a one or a two it overheats and you have to deal with losing your next turn and a few other things the hybrid doesn't overheat it goes berserk and so uh whenever you uh, uh downgrade on a d4 reactor die you have to roll on this uh roll table to see what happens as you lose control of your mecha so it could be you know uh as simple as oh you you know you damage yourself as you uh berserk rage across the field or it could be you attack an ally or uh you know uh, uh, you uh your mob beam goes out of control and you damage everything around you stuff like that so that was definitely inspired by evangelion and sort of the idea of like the the mecha being a creature in and of itself mm -hmm. um and then the Vanguard uh, is uh, kind of positioned as this uh, bleeding edge sort of alien designed mecha uh, with uh, a third arm that it can use to hold an extra weapon or stabilize a heavy weapon. And so uh, typically if you're wielding a heavy weapon in the mecha hack, you're going to be hitting harder, but it's going to be harder to hit. Uh, with the Vanguard, you can actually stabilize a heavy weapon with that third arm uh, in order to uh, you know, roll your attack normally. Uh, the big thing with the Vanguard, though, is it actually has the ability to um, divert power between its hit, between its damage die and its reactor die. So mm -hmm. uh, you can bump up your reactor die in exchange for damage uh, or vice versa, uh, which makes it a really fun uh, sort of tactical uh, mech to play. I have a, a player in a long-running campaign right now playing the Vanguard, and he's had a ton of fun uh, pushing his damage to the limit uh, <laughs> in sacrifice to his reactor. So, yeah. And now, when it comes now, um, 
when it comes to the when it comes to the um, berserk when it comes to the berserk um, part of the hybrid, I do see that there's a bit of a chart where it looks like you have to roll. I think that's a d8. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's a d8 or a d a d6. Yeah, and you you roll it um, in order to see what happens when you when you go berserk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, if some if if somebody was Given the fact that you're doing a very sandboxy approach, would it be how would you rationalize if somebody wanted to do if somebody wanted to do the hybrid but wasn't trying to do the whole notion of oh we built it around a kaiju or or something like that they wanted to go strictly all mechs or tech based. Mm -hmm. uh, with that, I would just have it be um, that the uh, the computer itself or the the sensors the systems itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, th would occasionally um, take over when it thought that the pilot wasn't doing what it should be doing. Um, and, we, you know, that's fairly prevalent in mecha media as well, uh, yeah. you know, with the zero system and stuff like that, where the, the mecha will actually take control of the pilot and utilize the pilot sort of like a puppet mm -hmm. uh, in order to achieve the mission. So, yeah, fairly easy to reskin it if you're not into the sort of biomechanical aspect of yeah. the hybrid. I'd, I'd only br I'd only bring that up because, um, and I I don't mean this may sound a bit tangential, but I ha I have had a an ish an issue with tr an issue with D and D being bo being um boasted as some sort of sandbox when it really isn't, right? Um, and when and with something like the Mecha Hack and its design as a sa as a sandbox, it's it could be very easy to fall into. A trap of of using certain genre assumptions, right? Um, and to that to that end, there is one there is one sort of approach when it comes to mecha that I that I find highly underutilized, both in media and to a, to a somewhat lesser extent in role playing games because you're going to have a bigger sandbox, but it's still not used as much. And that is doing a non SF approach when it comes to mecha. Um, right. A cup a couple examples like a couple examples I can think of are um, Aura Battler Dunbine, mm -hmm. um, Razafon, although that that one's a that one's a bit of an a bit of an iffy affair. Right. And um, the War Striders in Exalted. Okay. Yeah. Is would it be theoretically possible for someone to skin the Mecha Hack? to to um to lean to lean more towards magitech rather than rather than straight up science fiction. Yeah, I think absolutely you'd be able to um and I actually I have I have a, a kind of a plan to eventually um run a like Escaflone inspired uh campaign using the system because it would be easy enough to um, take uh, an element like the reactor die mm -hmm. and have it be more like, uh, okay, this this represents whatever magic is powering the mecha. You know, it could it might be a the heart of a dragon. It might be you know a, a magic user that is uh, helming the mech, sort of like a spell jammer sort of thing. Um, however, you want to do that. Um, and I've had a lot of people who use the mecha hack for uh, running lots of different games, uh, and so it's it's fairly easy to reskin. I've had people that. Uh, have done you know Warhammer games where you're playing as, uh, as Space Marines or you know Terminator armor stuff like that. Um, so people take this system and do all kinds of stuff with it, and it's it's really easy to look at the mechanics um, because they are so uh, sort of lightweight and just say okay, well this is it works the same way, but it's now this, um, and I think it's it's easy enough to do that with a with a system that is um, itself a hack but also designed to be hacked uh, yeah. from the get. So, yeah. And if my soundboard was working, this is where I'd play the Inception horn. <laughs> but now the, the, the other um, chassis that I didn't, that I didn't see the Im an image of, but is talked about in the uh, Kickstarter is the Colossus. What yes. can you tell me about that? <clears throat> Yeah, so the Colossus, uh, that, and that's actually the uh, the art that's on the main uh, Kickstarter header there. That is the Colossus. Mm -hmm. um, and the Colossus is actually a little bit more like Iron Giant uh, inspired. It's uh, a big hulking mecha that, can, uh, that has the largest hit die in the game. 
uh, and has the ability to go into what's called a battle mode where it can basically uh, initiate that battle mode and uh, it is easier to hit, but it takes less damage and dishes out more damage. All right, makes sense. Makes sense. Um, now, when it comes when it comes to the new the uh, new pilot types, um, Bionic, Merc, Pariah, and Vet. Now, mm -hmm. Merc and Vet, I can I can kind of get their general vibe just inferring off of the name. Um, totally. But what what can you tell me nar narratively about the Bionic and the Pariah in terms of the sort of character archetypes that they would lean to, and possibly a few examples in media. Yeah, absolutely. So the the bionic is uh, a, basically a cybernetically enhanced pilot. So they are um, the type of pilot that would be more fully integrated with uh, the mecha system itself. Um, and what inspired that was actually I was watching uh, Iron Blooded Orphans, and they have this idea of this um, this input jack that gets installed in the spine of the pilot, and then they can integrate. Uh, directly with the 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 frame of the of the mobile suit, and I really like this idea. And uh, you know, it's 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 a fairly like prevalent idea where uh, you know the pilot and the and the mecha are one, and they're fully integrated, and the pilot can feel what the mecha feels, and it allows them to like react instantaneously and stuff like that. And <clears throat> so I wanted a, a pilot that could be, uh, you know, in the words of Obi Wan Kenobi, more machine than man, uh, a pilot that is itself a little bit mechanical and robotic and so um they're able to uh better control the outputs of the reactor just because they're so in tune with the uh, the inner workings of the mecha mm. um and then with the with the pariah the pariah is kind of the like anime protagonist that you see uh in a lot of different mecha anime where they're kind of um outsiders uh not warriors themselves but actually uh somewhat pacifistic um a pariah is a pilot who is able to use their uh their strength of personality or their strength of will to avoid uh damage uh inside the mecha and so uh that was kind of pulled from you know this idea of like um the new type in gundam or um uh, really any sort of like anime protagonist who uh, doesn't want to fight, but has to uh, for the sake of either themselves or people that they care about. So uh, the pariah and the, and the bionic are definitely like a couple of the more like anime inspired uh, pilot types in the book. Whereas like the Merc and the vet, like you said, like those are definitely like a little bit more like battle techie type uh, uh, in, in tropes. Yeah. And when, now, given given all that, and of course you get you guys are still you guys are still working alongside Runehammer Runehammer Games when it comes to the um, art. Yes. Out of curiosity, how did you how did you end up um, getting in contact with um, Brandish Gilhelm? Was it a case where he came to you, or was it vice versa? So I, you know, I actually can't remember when we first interacted with uh, with Brandish. Um, I have been a fan of his YouTube channel for a really long time. And we, you know, actually chatted on and off for a while. Um, I had a YouTube channel as well. And um, we kind of connected through that. And then um, he actually worked with us on a few different of our uh, uh, previous products, um, working with us on the art and and helping to develop page elements and things like that. Um, and he has worked on Mecca before uh, when he used to work uh, in video games, he worked on a few uh, different designs uh, for various games. And uh, we came to him to see if he would be interested in doing the art for this little Mecca game that we had written. And at that point we had no idea what the art was going to look like. Um, and we kind of developed alongside each other, this idea of the, the black and white sort of minimalist sketchy sort of art. And I just absolutely fell in love with it. And uh you know, the art in the Mecha Hack, um, both the first and second edition of the game is, is fairly sparse. Uh, it's all black and white, but it definitely has like this really cool style to it that just um, it gets across like the theme of the game very, very well. And that was something that I just instantly fell in love with, where 
you can open the book and even if you don't read a single word, you look at the art and you kind of get a sense for what the game is about and how it plays. Um, it's just, it's a little rough around the edges. It's simple, but it's like, it looks and feels really cool. So, um, yeah, it's always great to work with him. He He's a phenomenal artist and a really fun, creative person to just like talk with. So, yeah. Yeah. It's def- and uh, and it definitely fits within the within the very minimalist style of well a lot of stuff that you see with with the black hack and and people's own hacks of it. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Now, what now? Um, it does now the mission manual does talk about some new add some new um add on rules like on on foot missions, allegiance, and, mm-hmm. and so on. What can you tell me about some about some of those and what you're planning? with the add-on rules yeah um so after mecha hack came out uh in 2018 i i instantly started writing more stuff for it just because i was having a lot of fun with the system and running a lot of games and in addition to that we had a lot of people who were running games and and giving us feedback um asking questions and things like that and so uh over the last couple years i've just been kind of writing up little rules here and there people wanted the ability to have the pilots be able to do stuff outside of the cockpit. And so I started tinkering with some on foot rules uh, Mm -hmm. for things to do outside of the Mecca. Uh, People wanted the game to be a little bit more lethal and gritty. They wanted mechs to be able to explode and uh, you know, pieces to rip off of them and stuff. And so I started working on uh, more lethal hard mode rules where you can run out of ammunition and explode when your reactor overheats and things like that. Um, we also uh, we really kind of enjoyed the little setting that we wrote uh, for the book, this mini setting called Lodestar Alpha. And uh, within that setting, there are these different factions sort of vying for control. And so uh, we wrote up some very, very simple um, allegiance rules where you can become friendly or hostile with these various factions and 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 reap different benefits. Um, we also have some like downtime rules for doing different things in between missions because that's again something that people were asking about. Mm-hmm. You know, what can I do with my mecha when we're not in a mission? Can I can I do different upgrades? Can I tinker with the systems? What you know? Can I go and secure resources for us? Things like that. Um, so a lot of it is stuff that people have asked us about. A lot of it is stuff that I want in a game. Um, you know, I, I, I find myself uh, wanting uh, rules to run big groups of enemies. And so that's something that we're including. Um, environment templates that can fit over any mission that, uh, you know, if, you're, if you want to run a mission in space or underwater or in a volcano, you can apply these different environment templates and provide different rules and options for the players. So... Um, yeah, that's the one of the sections of the book that I'm honestly most excited about um, is because it, it's it's just uh, it's fun to take a really simple lightweight system like the Mecha Hack and create different subsystems for it um, for people to kind of play around with and and find their the game that they want to run. All right, that which that definitely makes sense. Now, since hard since hard mode is is going to be in this as well. Um, Talk to me about what that particularly is going to ch- is going to change. So hard mode is uh, our, uh, our our name for these basically these variant rules that you can plug into your your mecha game. So you can use all of them, or you can use the ones that appeal to you. But um, the basic sort of overview of it is if you use all of the hard mode rules. Um, you can, like I said earlier, you can run out of ammunition. So basically, if you if you roll a one on a damage die, you've uh, you have to uh, re- reload that weapon before you can use it again. Uh, you uh, cannot use armor to soak critical damage. So critical damage goes right through armor. You can't you can't negate it with armor points. Um, when your mech goes down, if you become, become disabled, you have to roll a die every round to see if your mech explodes. And if it does, it deals damage to everybody nearby. If you're still inside of it, you die. Um, the dice da- or the uh, damage dice explode. If you roll the max result on a damage die, you get to roll it again and add that. So there's a possibility that you or an enemy will dish out enough damage to drop drop uh, each other in a single a single shot. Um, so there's a lot of different things there that are intended to um, make the game feel a little bit more lethal and dangerous, um, just because that is something that people wanted is a way for 
<laughs> a lot of GMs saying, I can't kill my players. Like, I, no matter how hard I try, I cannot destroy their mecha and kill these players. Like, what what do I need to do to make the game feel more lethal? So that's that's what the hard mode is there for. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, of course, some, of course, some, of course, I could easily see that being implemented to remind to remind people of the horrors of XCOM luck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure, very much so. Yeah. Um. Now, when it now, when it comes to the one, when it comes to the one-page missions, um, now when I when I hear that kind of thing, it conjures up some of the one-page adventures that um, Pinnacle used to do for Savage Worlds. Mm-hmm. Arguably, they still do, but I don't see them as I don't see them as much these days. Is that the approach that you guys are taking, where this is a one, this is a literal one-page adventure? Yeah, so they're all one page. Um, we we uh, developed a template, a format for it, where um, basically all the pieces of the mission would fit onto a single page. Um, so the idea here is that you have um, you have a mission briefing that you can use to kind of fill the players in on what the mission entails and what they're trying to do. There's a couple of role tables for generating things like objectives. If you want to have like sort of uh, secondary objectives that the players can try to get after, mm-hmm. uh, but there's also twists. You know, you can roll a twist, and it could be something like, uh, you know, one of your allies is working for the enemy, or uh, there's a bomb strapped to one of your mecha. You know, things like this that can really kind of in the middle of a mission really change things. Um, and then in addition to that, we have uh, basically three uh, scenes. We have a kickoff an action and a climax. And so it's basically a three part mission. And within each of those, you have various uh, challenges that have to be overcome. So um, the, the missions themselves, they're written in such a way that they almost read like prep notes, lots of bullet points, lots of short snappy phrases that, you know, a GM can kind of glance over and get the idea. Um, And in addition to those missions, you know, we've included a lot of different tools in the book so that people who are running these missions who want to do a little bit of prep and modify the missions to their taste, they have tools at their disposal so that they can uh, make changes to those, you know, changing up the enemies, changing up the environment, um, a- applying it to various factions and things like that. So um, I am a, uh, a prep light game master. I usually prep a single page of notes for myself. And so um, in terms of the tools that I would use as a game master, um, a one page mission is just right up my alley. You know, I don't want to be flipping through pages to have to run a mission when, when uh, my players are jazzed about, you know, mowing down enemies or whatever. I don't, I don't want the fun to uh, come at the cost of me trying to fumble and figure out what happens next. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that kind with that kind of thing in mind, um, within, within, within some of those, um, within some of those adventures, do you ha- do you have it set up about what would be suggested types of enemies within it, or is or is it more freeform? Yeah, we usually have um, the, some of the missions will have a suggestion for um, a challenge rating to include, or the types of enemies to include. Others call out enemies specifically by name. Use this enemy for this mission. Um, but uh, you know, we we have some really simple guidelines in there for. You know, if you look at the mission and you want to include different enemies, uh, here's the easy way to kind of swap them out. Uh, an example is I, I ran a mission um, for some players that was, as written, intended to be run in space, but the players decided that they wanted it to be underwater. They wanted to try out some of the underwater mechanics. And so um, I very quickly just swapped out, you know, the carrier ship with the interceptors with a submarine that could spawn these uh, these submersible drones. And uh, it was super easy to do, and it didn't really affect the mission one way or the other except putting that underwater template over the top of it and just swapping out some of those enemies for more thematically appropriate enemies. Oh, all right. Now, you've, we've, obviously talked about, we've obviously talked about Macross th- throughout this. And yeah. given given some given some of the motifs that we see with with me, with Mecca, this brings me to one thing that I ha- that I have to sort of reference, and that is the Itano Circus, <laughs> also known oh. as the Itano <laughs> Missile Massacre. And to that end, 
Something I'm curious about, and maybe, maybe this is something that's been that's been addressed in an ex an expansion, or or maybe even in a house rule. But how do you handle chases, especially when especially if somebody wanted to emulate the dogfighting that might be seen in something like Robotech or right. Macross? <clears throat> Yeah, <laughs> listen, you're you're not gonna get any shade from me about that. I I constantly call it Robotech, even though I know that's not really what it is. But um, yeah, that kind of like that high octane, like uh, you know, two two mechas zooming through space, clashing uh, is little more than like beams of light in the against the darkness of space. Like that's that's like one of my favorite things. So we actually have a few missions that have. Uh, some chase rules in them that have uh, basically treating it like a very simple skill challenge uh, that you can basically do um, uh, ability checks to see if you can stay near to your enemy or if they outrun you. And so we have a couple of different missions that involve that, uh, including one that is essentially a mecha death race mm -hmm. uh, that takes place in this gladiatorial arena where you're, uh, you're basically zooming through these tunnels inside an asteroid uh, trying to keep up and uh, win this race. Um, so that, you know, chases have a tendency to get very, very fiddly at the table. And I've run chases before uh, in D&D &D and, and things like that, where it's it's very easy to lose track of what's happening. And so for me, I just say, you know, keep it simple uh, it, and, and use these rules as we have them mm -hmm. to achieve that kind of feel of a chase. Because nothing is going to drag down the excitement of a, of a high speed chase than trying to figure out where everyone is on the map. You know what I mean? Like whenever, when it comes to, when it comes to, ch when it comes to things like chases for me personally, I've never used a map. It's all, yeah, I've, for um, sure. I've ten I've tended to operate under, under, a, under a case of fi fighting towards a goal or doing, or doing the exalted third edition thing of fighting for initiative. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the main, the main reason for that is try is focusing on what sort of, what sort of maneuvers you're, you're using, um, kind of defeats, kind of defeats the point since the whole point right. of a chase or something like that is largely, largely similar to, to seeing a, um, fencing match. You're seeing a whole. You're yeah. seeing a whole lot of. You're seeing a whole lot of dance, a whole lot of movements, parries, and so on, with both sides trying to trying to um, force an opening. Yeah. Yep. And I think I think I think um that I think that's a better approach than trying to finagle about the different types of maneuvers because, well, for one, you're trying to figure out maneuvers for things that don't exist, and two, if you want to try and use airplane <laughs> if you want to try and use airplane maneuvers and use that kind of dog fighting, well, good luck coming, good luck um, finding your way out of that rabbit hole, because yeah, I'm not giving yep, you a rope. It, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's very true. It's it's so easy to get bogged down in the minutia of it. So I prefer to lean on a little bit more like narrative, sort of cinematic style when it comes mm -hmm. to chases and things like that. Yeah, for sure. Um, there's a there, and to be honest, um, I do not see I do not see the mecha hack as something that would necessar necessarily suit suit itself all that well to grid combat it's one of those cases where you can do it for but sure. i feel like this leans more towards theater of the mind stuff because there's there's not a whole lot there's not a whole lot of um you're not going to see lengthy digressions on what counts as an attack of opportunity what yeah. counts as flanking <laughs> what doesn't count as flanking it's a case of if it counts it counts Yep, that's and that's uh, really you know where I design the game from too is uh, uh, this definitely theater of the mind more so than using maps and things like that. And we've included you know rules for you know if you want to play this on a grid, here's how to do it. But mm -hmm. it's definitely intended to be more uh, loosey goosey than that. Especially, especially if um, Especially if some, especially if somebody wanted to do max that where everybody has jump jets or something like that. Yep, totally. Yep. Um, which of course isn't going to be flying, but it's it's going to, it's going to be um, freeing a matrix style free your mind kind of leap. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yep. And with that, with that in mind, did you ever have a um, specific size of mech in my mi in mind when it came to designing, or were you go were you going for anything everything as small as s jumped up power armor to the giant fuck off that it that is the main <laughs> ship in Macross? Yeah, I, that was. Uh... I kind of wanted it to work for any scale. And that was really important to me uh, as someone that, you know, loves a good exosuit, you know, exo squad power armor situation. But I also love big towering Gundams, mm -hmm. uh, Titans from Warhammer. And, and like you said, the, the, the gigantic uh, mech from, from Macross. Um, and so scale for me was very much a, uh, a relative thing in the mecha hack. Everything kind of scales relatively where, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter how big the mechs are. They're big. You know, they're they're bigger than anything that exists right now, and that's yeah. that's that's all that matters. Yeah. Part of the part of the reason I asked that I asked that is the is I've always been a sucker for the concept of combined arms. And yep. be and being that you've played BattleTech, you should you're pro you're likely familiar with that kind of thing, since. Mm -hmm. You don't ju even though the battle mechs are a um, large part of it. You don't just have those. You have, you have, vi you have air vehicles. You've got ground vehicles. Yep. You've got, if you want to include the filthy clanners, you've got things like elementals, right? And all all of these all of these working in ta working in um, tandem, right. Plus, the, plus, there's the there's the fact that, um, sometimes sometimes ha sometimes you can, there are certain sizes that just would that just wouldn't fit a give a given um, play style. Yeah, no, for sure, absolutely. And while um while Bioware may have dropped the ball with it, I see a lot of role playing potential with the javelin suits in Anthem. Yeah, exactly. And that's, oh man, it's, it's funny you bring that up. It's such a bummer that that game wasn't better than it was because it was super up my alley. Um, but yeah, you can absolutely do like more of that, like kind of power suit, power armor sort of feel uh, with Mecha Hack and it, it, it absolutely works. So, yeah, I've, um, I've been reading Chris Fox's The Magitech Chronicles where, where you can't, you kind of have that power suit thing with the spell armors in that. Mm -hmm. And and while he has his own system for for running it, I I am one of those people who always likes to ha who always likes to hack just about every game that I get. Oh, for sure, yeah. Like, like when I when I got my hands on the mecha hack, I was thinking, okay, how could I adapt this to the Jovian Chronicles? Because I don't feel like running Shilouette again. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I like Shilouette. It is. It can be a little bit spiky sometimes, but. I do think that the Jovian Chronicles is really underrated as far as doing a mech setting. Yeah, no, absolutely. I agree with that. Um, now, with that, with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as page size? Um, putting, a, putting aside stretch goals, which obviously would, inc obviously would increase the uh, total page size of the book. Right. So uh, with the like when we set out to write the book, I was imagining it being uh, probably about twice the size of the Mecha Hack. Um, mm -hmm. The Mecha Hack is, is you know, it's about 40 pages. It's it's very slim uh, and sleek and you flip through it and find what you need. Um, this is chock full of stuff. So it has, you know, the same amount of chassis, the same amount of pilots, uh, a similar number of modules and things like that. And then in addition to that, it has over 40 of these missions, these one page missions. So, I mean, that's 40 pages right there. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, all of the, all of the additional rules that we're throwing in there and the new GM tools with the various rule tables and stuff. So I would imagine that we're looking at probably close to 80 pages, if not a little bit bigger than that. So still a slim book. Uh, it's not going to take up a ton of room on your shelf. Um, and it is the same sort of a five sized, um, uh, small size book as mm -hmm. mecha hack and the black hack. Um, but yeah, shooting for around eight, I think, is what we're going to be looking at here. So, oh, all right, and, and even with that, even with that size, I do appreciate, like for 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 the mecha hack, I appreciated that there's a proper a proper set of bookmarks and the like, and for and for the mission manual, I'd imagine that there's going to be the same thing and a set of proper bookmarks. 
Yes, absolutely. And that's that's really important to me because uh, I do all of our layout as well. And um, it's really important to me that the PDFs f are usable, that you can click around and find what you need. And so that means a hyperlinked TOC, bookmarks on the PDF, things like that. So mm -hmm. um, it's really easy to find your way around the book, uh, whether you're looking at it on a screen or in your hands. Yeah. The thing, the thing is for me, um, I am very, very big on navigation. Right. And there's there's been a few there's been a few tabletop designers who I've got no beef with, but I ended up um, I ended up having to give them the stare because they made the, because they made a large PDF and didn't put in an index. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. Hi, Palladium. How you doing? <laughs> and on the and of course on the on the other on the other side of things. I have an unwritten rule that if you've got a if you've got a book that's more than a hundred pages and you don't in PDF form and you don't have bookmarks, stop. <laughs> right. Yep. Now, fortune. Now, um, of course, the Mecha Hack didn't didn't have a didn't have a index per se, but I but I am willing to let that slide because again, hyperlinked um, TLC and yep. book and bookmarks throughout the thing. So. It's like at that point, it's when it's and it's only forty eight pages, so it's a case of does it really need a traditional index? Right. Yeah, for sure. Now, you guys are you guys have about eight days to go at the time of this recording, um, and have completely smashed the initial five thousand goal. You're yeah. You're, you're four times you're four times over and a little bit of change, and it's probably going to be higher than that by the end of it. What are you shooting for as far as a release window? Uh, so the book itself is pretty much entirely written. Uh, we're obviously, we're uh, the stretch goal stuff. We're writing that now. Uh, we have our freelancers working on more missions for the book, uh, for that stretch goal that we unlocked at 18,000. Um, and we've got Brandish working on the new art and the new character sheet and stuff. So that's awesome. Uh, so our a goal right now is to get it out to people by March, uh, April at the latest. Um, uh, we'll probably hit that if not sooner, just because everything is already sort of in place and uh, layout shouldn't take uh, too long. I'm going to knock on wood here. Uh, but <laughs> uh, so that's what we're shooting for is March or April for uh, PDF and then physical copies going out uh, shortly after that. All right. Now, and I'll definitely be looking forward to that when the when the time comes. Great. Plus. Plus it plus some I, plus I can use that so that my so that um friend of the show James Streisen stops slandering me about about me having the audacity to say that Stompy Max are better which I never said <laughs> <laughs> but he he's he's as much of a shit poster as I am so you know how it is <laughs> um the only reason the only reason I ended up bringing up Stompy Max was because I was enjoying the urban mech memes right <laughs> you know it's a tr it's it's a friggin' trash can with a gun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> can't really go wrong. Yeah, uh, but with that with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here. <laughs> I I'm more than happy to. This has been great chatting with you. So thank you. Uh, and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. Great. As I always say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay... Fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs> <laughs>